Greetings from Latter-day Media, presenting our dear friend and epic historian on Joseph Smith and church history, Brother K. Godfrey. This Come Follow Me video series is a bonus resource to enhance your appreciation of the Prophet Joseph Smith with little-known facts and research about American and church history. We would appreciate you clicking the like button and sharing each video so we can continue bringing you more fascinating content. Episode 4, Doctrine and Covenants 3-5 through five. One Man's Search for the Perfect Stone Welcome back. It's good to be with you again. You remember last time we met, we talked about a special presentation today that uh, we've entitled One Man's Search for the Perfect Stone. I need to give you a little bit of a uh, background on this before I begin this story. And I'm going to begin with this, uh, this picture that I have on the easel behind me on the left here. In 1905, the Randolph Herald, uh, it's a newspaper there near uh, Sharon, Vermont, covered the story of the Joseph Smith Birthplace uh, Monument dedication. They said, relative to that dedication, as is quoted in the, uh, in the article here, that the birthplace of the first Mormon was marked by a splendid monument. Well, in 2005, the Herald reproduced the story, marking the centennial anniversary of the monument's dedication. And that story, again, is, is shown here. It's a very, very fascinating newspaper article, to say the least. Well, while in Vermont, uh, I had an opportunity to research the monument and its construction and those that were involved in it. This uh, slide here shows many of those who were involved in the construction of the monument and what they did and where they were from. The list includes over a hundred people from 11 different townships. This was not just a, a share of Vermont experience, this was a Vermont experience. After researching the monument, I contacted the Herald and asked them to print a five-part story in their newspaper called One Man's Search for the Perfect Stone. The final chapter would then be read at an activity that we would have there at the Joseph Smith Birthplace site that we called the Reunion Picnic. Let me read to you right from the newspaper what the Herald had to say with regards to our, our reunion picnic. The August 4th event celebrating the history of the Joseph Smith Birthplace Monument attracted a crowd of 250. Twelve of those pictured above were recognized as having direct ancestral ties to those who built the monument, which is visible in the background. The day included demonstrations, a barbecue, and two readings of the final chapter printed below. Below is the final installment of the historical account of the literally monumental effort it took to erect the Joseph Smith Monument at the Derry Hill site in Sharon in 1905. The project would never have happened without the perseverance of Junius Wells of Utah, who made it a personal goal to have the memorial in place before the end of 1905, the centennial anniversary of Smith's birth in 1805. The first part of the history appeared in the July 19th edition of the Herald. The author, Elder K. Godfrey, period historian for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, asked that the final chapter not be published until after the August 4th event at the Joseph Smith Birthplace Memorial, celebrating the history of the monument's construction. These folks pictured here are those who have the ancestral ties directly to those who built the monument and uh, recognitions were given them. It was a wonderful event and very exciting to have been a part of. Now the final outcome of the research that we did was the creation of a book. I have it right here in front of me. This book here, and I'll just open it up and kind of thumb through the pages here a little bit, helped us as missionaries to be able to tell the story of the monument and its construction. It, it was a tremendous aid in uh, sharing this story with guests, especially during the winter time, perhaps when it was too cold to get out and talk the story right at the monument site. So um, yes, this was a, this was a great uh, item to, uh, to have been able to likewise been a part of. So with all that having been said, let me share with you the story of one man's search for the perfect stone. Chapter 1. 
In the beginning was Junius F. Wells. In August of 1894, while on one of his many trips, Junius Wells took a detour through Vermont. He found his way to the Sharon Town Clerk's office where he was directed to Harvey Smith, a longtime resident with the history of the region. Wells asked Harvey about the location of the birthplace of Joseph Smith, Jr. After purchasing some maple syrup for his wife, he was taken out across the field to an old cellar hole. The site consisted of crumbling walls, a few foundation stones, and overgrown shrubbery. This was the physical remains of the Smith home where the prophet Joseph Smith was born. Wells later recalled, as he rode away from the birthplace, he said to himself, and I quote, Sometime we ought to mark this place with a monument of the faith of our people in Joseph Smith the prophet. In March of 1905, Wells found himself again in New England. This time he was contracting for a piece of Vermont granite for his father's headstone in Salt Lake City. The monument contractor was Riley C. Bowers from Montpelier. In the course of this exchange, Wells mentioned the idea of a monument to Joseph Smith in Sharon to commemorate the centennial anniversary of the birth in 1805. Bowers thought the idea was certainly workable, so with this endorsement, Wells returned to Salt Lake to share his idea with the First Presidency of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. In a letter dated April 1, 1905, Wells made his pitch to President Joseph F. Smith and his counselors. Although the letter has not survived, Wells offered to supervise the project and took the liberty of proposing a monument for the site recommending its dimensions, an inscription, and even including a sketch of the proposal. The First Presidency was a little more guarded and instructed Wells that the first thing needed was to verify the location of the prophet's birth and then attempt to purchase the land. Only then would they consider the proposal of building a monument. On May 10, 1905, Wells left for Vermont, determined to erect a monument in six months that would typically have taken 12 months to accomplish, and he was going to need a lot of help. Chapter 2 Wells settled into the South Royalton House. This would now become his headquarters. The local newspaper soon picked up on his presence in town. They reported that, Quote, he made no secret of his purpose, which was to settle indubitably the exact spot where Joseph Smith was born and to acquire the premises and to erect a monument thereon. Wells recalled that with the help of Daniel E. Parkhurst, a shoemaker and town clerk and treasurer of Sharon, records were found tracing the Solomon Mack property back to King George III and New Hampshire Governor Benning Wentworth in 1761. Wells then visited William Skinner, town clerk of Royalton. Here he found out that the Mack property lay both in Sharon and Royalton townships. Wells identified that C.H. Robinson presently owned the land in both townships. On May 19, 1905, Wells visited the site with Benjamin Cole Latham, who gave testimony of it being the birthplace site. Others like Maria Griffiths and Harvey Smith went on record with their own testimonials. The help needed, Wells, was now pouring in. Wells bargained with C.H. Robinson for the purchase of 68 acres, as well as a narrow strip of land connecting the birthplace site with Derry Hill Road, the transaction also included two springs, the Solomon Mac Foundation site, the White Brook that ran through the site, and a portion of the Old Sharon Road. Junius Wells then returned to Salt Lake City to attend to the dedication of the headstone that he was having erected for his father, built by R.C. Bauer Granite Company of Montpelier, Vermont. It was a 15-foot-tall obelisk. His father, Daniel Wells, had died in 1891, and Junius was just now finally having the stone put in place. The headstone size and shape were all indicative of the life of his father, and this would be a typecast of what Junius would eventually do at the Joseph Smith Monument site. This event allowed the First Presidency of the Church to see both Junius Wells and Mr. Bowers from Montpelier in action together. 
During the first week of June of 1905, Welsh prepared for the First Presidency a detailed report of his activities in Vermont. He also provided a detailed sketch of the monument, suggesting the use of gray, berry granite. He also proposed the tribute that would appear on the inscription die and the capstone. After some deliberation, the First Presidency approved the project with only one minor inscription change. By July 1, 1905, the announcement of the project was made public. On July 6, Wells was given full power of attorney to erect a granite monument in memory of the Prophet Joseph Smith and Patriarch Hiram Smith. Wells now had a carte blanche to carry out the project. This was the easy part. Now the fun would begin. Chapter 3 on July 13th, Wells was back in Vermont. He went immediately to Barry, where over 100 quarry firms were located. On the 24th of July, Wells awarded the general contract to his friend, the owner of the R.C. Bowers Granite Company of Montpelier. Wells moved his residence to Montpelier so that he could personally supervise the work. He had five months to complete the project, and every day was a day closer to the December 23rd dedication. Wells felt that his job was to, quote, continually be pushing the project along. Bowers subcontracted the quarrying to the Mar Gordon Quarry in Barrie. Wells reported, quote, the first success came when a piece of granite suitable for the die and capstone was found. Quarrymen soon found a piece sufficient for the first and second base. As you can see, the monument has two base stones, an inscription die, a capstone, and a pillar. And I continue, quote, But after removing a large piece for the first base, they found that one corner was cut off, rendering the piece insufficient for the second base. This was very discouraging. However, a suitable piece was soon found and discovered in an opposite side of the quarry. With work slowly progressing at the quarry, Wells focused now his attention back to South Royalton. Wells contracted with supervisors Walker and Gallison to start preparations for the birthplace park, roads, walks, and building lots. By mid-August, Wells had 15 Italian laborers working at the site. Wells also contracted with Joseph Perkins to build a memorial cottage directly over the old cellar hole and to incorporate the hearthstone in its original position into the cottage fireplace. Wells is very conscious about the importance of the hearthstone. He said, If Joseph had any association with the hearthstone, it was as a child. Perhaps it was there that he was washed and dressed as a babe. But all was not well in paradise. There were pressing issues now north in Barrie. Workers at the Mar Gordon Quarry had found four pieces of stone, but the most difficult, the 40-foot shaft, still remained to be located, and time was running out. Wells was searching for, and I quote, a perfect shaft that would typify a perfect man. Joseph died at age 38 and a half years, and the visible portion of the shaft needed to be 38 and a half feet tall. Wells was starting to get concerned and discouraged. Mr. Blackney, the foreman, tried numerous stones at various locations throughout the quarry to no avail. Wells said, and I quote, It was now a hopeless hope to me. I had not the faith in me. I had not the impression. I had been going by impressions all the way through. Somehow, when I had the right impression, it had come out all right. But I have had no impressions. Well, with no impressions and no feelings and no revelation, there would be no assurances. Wells began to wonder if his dream would ever come to pass. Wells needed a little miracle, and one was on the way. Chapter 4 It seems that while Junius Wells was searching for his pillar stone, the Mar Gordon quarry they were looking in was now being purchased. The buyer, Mr. James M. Boutwell of the Boutwell Mill Varnum Company, owned an adjoining quarry. Wells recalled that the company took over his contract with great skill. Wells was told by Barnum to look out perhaps for his stone in his quarry. Two days later, in this adjoining quarry, quote, a partially disclosed stone was found that showed great promise. Mr. Farnsworth, the foreman, said it would be a week before they could be sure it was going to be big enough. However, Wells said, and I quote, I believed at once we were on the right track. 
It was a happy day for Wells when Farnsworth announced that the shaft was 46 feet long, sufficient for the monument. The rough stone weighed 60 ton, and it took Quote, the ingenuity of both Mr. Boutwell and Mr. Varnum combined to raise it out of the quarry. A temporary railroad spur was constructed to transport the stone to the main line. It took two days to load the stone on the railroad car because the derrick could only lift one end at a time. The rough stone was now sent six miles by train to the Barclay Brothers cutting and polishing shed. Upon arrival, powerful steam cranes and chains lifted the shaft off the railroad car, inverted it, and lowered it into the cutting blocks, where it was cut in just 16 minutes. Wells marveled at the difference when knowing how and having the mechanical means and power and not having it. The stones were cut with remarkable skill and clarity. It was now the first part of October. The dedication date of December 23rd was drawing near. Wells worried about the weather. The previous year, two feet of snow had already fallen by the 1st of November. As October drew to a close, the polishing phase was completed. Wells was now faced with the prospect of transporting 100 ton of stone. The 40-ton pillar seemed especially daunting. Wells recalled that no one had ever moved polished stone so far. Fortunately for Wells, a railroad line ran from Barrie to Royalton. The issue would be the six-mile stretch from Royalton to the monument site. Wells awarded the transportation contract to Mr. M. F. Howland of Barrie. Mr. Howland recommended that a special wagon that he had built for the removal of stone at St. John's Cathedral in New York be used to move the stone from Royalton to the monument site. The wagon had 20-inch wide wheels, axles 8 feet long and 8 inches in diameter, and the wagon weighed 8 ton. With anticipation, Everyone awaited in Royalton Village for the arrival of the stone. The base pieces would be the first to arrive. What Wells was about to learn was his greatest challenges now lay ahead. The final chapter. Unloading in Royalton meant the bridge over the first branch of the White River in South Royalton would need to be firmed up. This task required, quote, much scavengering all over the state for the right timbers, the first load to leave Royalton contained the two base pieces of the monument. Mr. Ellis of Bethel Quarries sent 20 horses to pull the load. Two other horses were picked up in Royalton. Once the horses had moved the load to the main road from the railroad car, they stopped dead in their tracks. 22 horses could not move the 31-ton base pieces up the simple rise of White River Road. A discouraged Mr. Wells returned to South Royalton and drafted a telegram to President Joseph F. Smith. He asked to ship the stones to Salt Lake City to have them erected on the temple block. He kept the telegram in his pocket but did not send it. It was decided that block and tackle would be used, horses and oxen pulling in the opposite direction of each other using the largest trees as hinged points. The winding White River Road was slow going. Even with the 20-inch wheels, the wagon sunk into the mud. The crews resorted to placing 10 by 3 inch hardwood planks under the wheels. After one week, the wagon had traveled two miles to the town of South Royalton. Slowly, the crew arrived at the base of Dairy Hill Road, only two miles left. Unfortunately, they had an 800-foot climb in front of them. The crew inched up the narrow, winding, muddy, unpaved country road using block and tackle and trees to serve as the support points. The road behind them was, quote, strewn with trees, some large ones that were pulled out by the roots. It looked as though a hurricane had come down Derry Hill Road. A week later, the bases arrived at the monument site. The bases had landed in late October, the original plan was to have had the entire monument completed by this time. The next stone up was the 19-ton, 6-foot inscription die. They traveled without incident until they arrived at the recently reinforced covered bridge over the Tunbird Branch. The combined height of the wagon and the die was 12 feet 2 inches, but the opening 
in the covered bridge was 11 foot 4 inches. H.C. Leonard of Barry brought down a special low-to-the-ground wagon. The low wagon would enable the die stone to pass under the covered bridge and to sit low to the ground so it would not become unstable as they traveled up Derry Hill Road. This was truly a miracle that such a wagon even existed and was nearby. The large wagon then returned to Royalton to prepare to move the 40-ton shaft. At this point, Wells had four teams of local men working on the project. One team was preparing to move the shaft, one was transporting the die, one was preparing the monument, and one was building the first visitor center or cottage over the birthplace site. The crews were being paid well, $2 a day with dinner provided. On November 7th, Wells began to haul the shaft. It was a 40 foot long and weighed 80,000 pounds, 40 ton. It would take 33 days to move the shaft to the monument location. They traveled about the length of a football field is all a day. Wells recalled the day that they arrived at the foot of Haynes Hill. Haynes Hill is on the stretch, that two-mile stretch heading up uh, Derry Hill Road. It rained all that day. In front of them lay Mr. Button's bog or mud hole. A neighbor was seen hurrying his empty hay wagon through the bog. Quote, the wheels sunk deeper and deeper into that miserable little bog. With great difficulty, four horses were required to remove the hay wagon. Wells dismissed the crew. Was it finally time to send the telegram that he had been carrying in his pocket? When alone, he knelt in prayer, asking for a miracle, and he returned to his hotel. Later that night, a miracle happened. Now, if we were to describe what took place in weatherman terms, it would be perhaps as follows. From out of Alberta, a strong Canadian clipper formed, a very cold wind blowing west to east. As it neared the nor'eastern states, and due to an extreme low pressure off the coast of Maine, it turned the Canadian clipper south into a cold nor'eastern wind. It picked up speed through the notched valleys of Vermont, and it began to snow. The temperature suddenly plummeted 35 degrees in three hours. The crew, knowing something special had happened, reassembled. Mr. Button's bog seemed to be frozen. The crew decided because of the weight of the stone and the uncertainty of frozen ground, they would lay hardwood planks under the wheels, nine inches thick under each wheel. As the horses heaved, the weight of the load split the planks into kindling. The ground was frozen as hard as steel. The crew moved the shaft over the frozen mud and up the hill so quickly that it arrived a day before the inscription die. Wells asked one of the men riding with him if he believed in miracles. The man replied, I almost believe it. Well, the ten-ton molded cap was the last stone to arrive. It was the lightest of the stones, but required a draw of 14 horses, and this was due to the small six-inch wide wheels, for if they stopped at all on the way up, they would probably not get started again. The stone made the trek in just six hours. It was now November 26th. All stones were at the site. It was time to stand the stones. A large derrick had been sent for from Pennsylvania and had just arrived the day before. To place the 40-foot shaft, it would have to be lifted 13 feet into the air, turned perpendicular, and set into place. The process would take place on December the 8th. When the signal was given, the assembled crowd started cheering, but they were suddenly stopped as they heard Mr. Wells shouting, Stop! Stop! Wells then dropped to his knees at the foot of the monument and offered a prayer of thanks. He then jumped to his feet and yelled, All right, boys, I am with you now. Let her go. After 137 days of anxious work and miracle after miracle, the Joseph Smith Birthplace Monument was completed. It was dedicated on Saturday, December 23, 1905, by President Joseph F. Smith, and at that dedication, one man's quest for the perfect stone was over. I hope you've enjoyed our story of one man's search for the perfect stone. It truly is a miraculous story. I've enjoyed sharing it with you today. Now, the next podcast we have, we're going to uh, 
go with the Smith family from New England. We're gonna, we've, we've established a foundation for the Smiths and we're gonna leave with them from Norwich and, uh, and head to New York where they're gonna settle in a sleepy little hamlet called Palmyra. So until then, thank you for joining me and I look forward to meeting with you again. Thank you for listening today and for sharing this ComeFollowMe2021.com website. To contact Kay, email him at footstepsofjoseph at gmail.com. And coming soon are six hours of DVDs following the footsteps of Joseph. We appreciate you, our dear listening friends.